Hi, my name is Kira Deschamps and I am one of the elders here at the University City Seventh-day Adventist Church and I would like to welcome all of you on this Sabbath day. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to give a welcome and the last time I did that we were actually in our church. So I can't wait until we're able to get back to our church and we can see everybody face to face. Um, and not through the screen. But anyway, welcome to the church and welcome to um, our services today. Um, one of the things that I, um, we've been having lots and lots of conversations, great conversations, um, you know, with uh, some of the elders and some of our church members and friends as we all uh, navigate together through uh, the state of our communities and the state of um, a lot of our African-American families and the world that's going on today. And I appreciate it. I appreciate the calls. I appreciate the um, prayers. I appreciate the conversations, the dialogue. Um, uh, sometimes even some of the challenging messages is not always easy to navigate. Um, it takes a lot of vulnerability on both sides. You know, people trying to understand, you know, what's happening in our world today and, and then people trying to explain what's happening. It's not always easy, but I praise God that we have um, leadership in our church and, and members in our church that are willing to go there to those places and have deeper conversations. And that's what's important about um, growth. That that's, that's what takes our church forward and um, takes our members forward. And, you know, learning the truth about things isn't always easy. 
Um, and so I just want to continue challenging everybody to continue having those conversations because they are very welcomed. Um, today, I also want to um, just share a couple of the announcements. Um, I know our young people um, are starting to be able to see each other in different ways. We're celebrating graduations. We're celebrating birthdays. Uh, some things we just make up celebrations for just so we can have a reason to celebrate. So, um, but we definitely want to caution everybody um, to definitely um, stick by your, the COVID practices, our safety protocols of wiping things down, washing our hands very thoroughly and um, social distancing. I know a lot of us have been outside more. So um, we're hoping that you are able to enjoy each other's company, but also remembering um, to keep each other safe. Uh, wearing your mask um, and wiping down those, uh, you know, high uh, impact type surfaces. So um, do that, but also continue um, reaching out to each other. Our um, offering today is for women's ministry. So I'm also excited to talk about that. It's either going to be Adventist education or it's going to be women's ministry Those are or youth. Those are usually my um, great topics to talk about. So women's ministry. Um, so, you know, when we do our offering, of course, we're using Adventist giving. So we would like for you, if you're uh, tech savvy and you know how to go online, you can always return your tithe and offering there and give any type of special um, givings. And then you can also mail um, your checks or money orders to our P.O. box, our church P.O. box. Um, and so we'll make sure that information is also available to you on the screen so that you will know where to mail um, your tithe and offering. Just make sure you uh, identify exactly where it needs to go. Uh, so let's go back to women's ministry. Um, I have the pleasure of being on the part of the uh, Carolina Conference uh, Women's Ministry Council. And so it's exciting that we get to get together as a, a committee to start talking about how we can, you know, minister and reach many, many more women, especially with our women's uh, ministry retreat. So uh, that is one of the things that we'll be talking about this coming week as a council. So I'm excited about that. Um, also, I know that uh, Beth Grissom, one of our elders here, she is, uh, she and another um, uh, uh, woman, uh, Kim Cove, in our um, conference, they have a podcast ministry through the conference and it is called Joy in the Weeds. It is great. If you haven't listened to any of the podcasts, we want you to listen to them. Be blessed. Um, there's a lot of great guest speakers, great topics, and there's some really interesting ones that are coming up too, where they've had some um, outside speakers coming in. And so we um, are looking forward to that. And, um, and there'll be more about our Women's Ministry Retreat. But just celebrate each other. Um, of course, I'm a woman, so I wanted to make sure I plug in to celebrate our women um, that are doing so much um, in ministry in many different ways, whether you're uh, praying with someone, preaching a sermon, doing a podcast, taking care of children, whatever it is, be blessed and we support our women. But before I leave you um, with a prayer, I do want to share scripture, Matthew 19, 13 through 15, as we again continue to learn more about taking care of each other as a church and brothers and sisters. Jesus blesses the little children in Matthew. He says, then the little children were brought to him that he might be, he might, he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid, he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Jesus is the caretaker, and if anybody was suffering, if the children, if anybody rebuked, the children from coming for, to him, you know, people, our family members, or if anybody was hurting in our family, in our in our church family, Jesus said, "Don't don't rebuke them, don't keep them from coming to me." And he laid the, his hands on them. No, we're not really laying hands on people much lately, but our spiritual hands are there with each other every day, 
reach out across you know the internet reach out across zoom reach out across you know the street just raise your hands up high and reach out and go to that spiritual place as you're praying over different people and you're praying for their homes and you're praying for the jobs people that are being furloughed people's hours that are being cut back we're praying for each one of them so i just ask that you think about those who've been rebuked and those have been kept back um, from reaching Jesus. Let's just think about them right now as we pray. Father God, I ask that you will, um, we just thank you right now that we can come to this place. We just thank you right now for this Sabbath day. We thank you right now, Lord, that we can come together um, even though we're virtual right now, but Lord, we know that your spirit is everywhere. And we thank you right now, God, that we can just reach our hand out, Lord, and, and reach out and say, you know what? My brother needs help. My sister needs help. This family that needs healing, Father, we know that certain people have um, lost jobs or, you know, received furlough, cut and pay, things like that, Father. They don't know, you know, small businesses have been closing. There's just a lot going on sometimes that we don't know about. There have been people whose families have been affected um, through by COVID that have been sick, Father. So help us not to forget, even though we're healthy and things are going, maybe going well in our own lives, help us not to forget those that, um, that are feeling down, that there's some depression, there's still a lot of isolation going on in our, in our um, homes and, and in our church members. Lord, we reach out to those who we have not talked to and we haven't heard from since this happened, or people that, um, you know, that are just isolated. So we just reach out to them right now, Lord, help us and put in our spirit to reach out and call them, to send letters, any kind of encouragement. We just want to lift each other up, Father. Wherever anybody may be when they're listening to this message, if they're traveling, whatever it may be, Father, we ask that you wrap your arms around them. May the blood of Jesus bless their home and be covered from head to toe. If they're traveling right now, Father, we send your angels and mercies ahead of them to pave the, the highways and everybody traveling, Lord, to have safe traveling mercies. Lord, we ask that you have a bridge, a hedge of protection around our homes, a hedge of protection around our church, Lord. Um, and I ask that you will keep us safe and healthy until we're able to all meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You have a blessed Sabbath day. Thank you so much for joining us until we meet again. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, boys and girls. Today, I have an experiment with Skittles. Do you like Skittles? But first, we're going to read a story. Today, I have a story for you. It's called God's Very Good Idea. In the beginning, in fact, before the beginning, God had a very good idea. It was an even better idea than solar panels, chocolate chip cookies, the super soaker, color TV, fireworks, the life raft, roller skates, and the x-ray machine. God's idea was to make people and lots of people, lots of different people who would enjoy loving him and loving each other. They would all be made in his image. They would all be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, so they would be full of love too. So God got to work. He made a beautiful world for the people to live in. Then he made the first people, a man and a woman. And he said to them, be happy, enjoy loving me and loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. God carried on creating people. All of them were made in his image. All of them were different too. Some were men and some were women. Some liked reading and some liked bikes. Some had darker skin and some had lighter skin. Some had curly hair and some had straight hair. 
We live in God's world. We are all different, but we are also all the same. Everyone you see is different than you and the same as you. They might look different or speak different or play different, but they are all made in God's image. And so they are all valuable. This is God's very good idea. But people ruin God's very good idea. The first people chose not to love God. This is called sin. And they chose not to love God as they should. They forgot how to love each other as they should. We are the same. We choose not to love God. And so we are not able to love others like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat others badly because they are different than us. People fight with each other. People are mean to each other. People laugh at each other. Because we have ruined God's very good idea, he is not pleased with us. Our sin means we can't be friends with him or enjoy living with him. We need God's forgiveness for ruining his very good idea. And it's the same for everyone in the world. People who like reading need forgiveness. People who like riding bikes need forgiveness. People with darker skin need forgiveness and people with lighter skin need forgiveness. People with curly hair need forgiveness and people with straight hair need forgiveness. But God was not surprised by people ruining things. He had always had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. So God got to work. He came to earth as a person, Jesus. Jesus loved people who were different than him. He loved people who no one else loved. He always enjoyed loving all the different people he met. Jesus shows to how to enjoy loving others. But people didn't love Jesus. Instead, they hated him. They put him on a cross to die. But this was a part of God's plan. On the cross, Jesus took our sin so that we can be forgiven. Jesus forgives his people for their sins. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose back to life and then he went back to live in heaven. And then he gave people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving all the different people they know. Jesus helps us to love each other. One day, God will finish his very good idea. Jesus will come back and make the world perfect again. And anyone who has asked Jesus to forgive them will live there with their different languages and skin colors. They will enjoy loving God and loving each other. They will enjoy praising God for making, rescuing, and finishing his very good idea. But here's the very, very good part of God's good idea. You don't have to wait till then to enjoy it. Jesus welcomes anyone who asks him to forgive them. And when Jesus welcomes someone, he welcomes them into his family forever. He welcomes people who like reading, people who like riding bikes. He welcomes people with darker skin and people with lighter skin. He welcomes people with curly hair and people with straight hair. God family is called the church. Your church friends are your brothers and sisters your wonderful and colorful church family. You can enjoy loving them and loving God with them. This is God's very good idea. Lots of different people enjoying loving him and loving each other. God made it, people ruined it. He rescued it, he will finish it. And with your church family, you can enjoy being part of it right now. I have some water here. This represents God's love. And these Skittles represent us here at University City Seventh-day Adventist Church. And just like they're all different colors, we have different skin colors, we're different ages, we don't look the same. But when we come together with God's love, we can make something beautiful just like these Skittles and the warm water. If we allow God's love into our lives, he can make something more beautiful and bigger than ourselves.
Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful story that explains to us how we're all so unique and different and made in your image. We pray that we will put your love into action so that we can create something beautiful. Amen. See, do you see the beauty that we can make? Just like these Skittles and warm water made this beauty. Let's look for that this week. Jesus fill this place. Come, sweet presence of Jesus, fill this place. We love you, we love you, worship and adore you. Come, sweet presence of Jesus, fill this place.
treasure for your presence, for the glory of your name. Thank you for the way that you love us. Jesus, faithful King, Lord, with grateful hearts you sing. How great is the love, how great is the love of our Savior.
Verses 22 through 31. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is God's word. Let us pray. Our King, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your power to heal blind eyes. Please work your miracles in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So I'm actually doing a series, and uh, I know it's not readily apparent because I keep interrupting the series with, uh, with other things that I think are, are more important. Last week was July 4, and so needed to preach a message connected to July 4. But um, I'm continuing a series that's been going on now for a long time where I've been looking at questions that Jesus asks. And so the last time I did this was a question in Mark. It's actually the story right before this one where the disciples are in a boat with Jesus they're kind of worried about not having enough food. And Jesus is saying, are you guys so thick-headed? You know, he's got this string of questions that he asked them. So if you remember from that previous message, here's the string of questions. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Jesus is basically saying, don't you get it? Don't you realize who I am? And then later, in the passage we just read, Jesus asked this question, who do people say that I am? And then he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And this seems to be the theme of this section in Mark. Who is Jesus and, and who gets it? You know, do people realize who Jesus really is? Who do you say that I am? So it's a little bit odd, or it seems a little odd perhaps, that there's this miracle story dropped right in the middle um, between these two episodes with the disciples. But it's not quite so odd if you think about the theme that's going on. The theme is eyesight. You know, Jesus says to the disciples, do you have eyes but you fail to see? Don't you get it? Don't you understand? And here is a miracle of healing dropped right in the middle. And I think Mark does this on purpose. Of course, obviously, you know, this is a strange story. It's the only story, the only healing in the Gospels in which um, the healing doesn't take right away. You know, it's kind of this two-stage healing. Jesus... Um, spits in the man's eyes, which is kind of weird in and of itself, uh, but the man's not fully healed. And Jesus has to ask, has to ask him, you know, what do you see? And he, and, and he has this strange response. I see people, but they're like trees walking around. And then Jesus touches him a second time and heals him. And then, then Mark is pretty emphatic. He, he really saw clearly at that point. Everything was clear and, and he was healed. This two-stage healing. Now, the first thing I think we ought to notice about this story is, is the fact that um, if you were going to make up a story about Jesus, if you were going to make up these stories about uh, you know, a, a miracle worker um, sent from heaven, you wouldn't write a story like this. You know, the only reason this story is here is because it actually happened. Um, if you were making this up, you wouldn't have Jesus have, have a halfway healing. I mean, Jesus looks bad. It's, it's, it's weird. It's strange. Um, and also, you know, this is, this is kind of neat, the, what the guy says. He, he says, I, I see people like trees walking. Um, that wouldn't be there unless, you know, this, this is somebody who was there remembering what happened. This guy actually said that. It's, it's just too unique an episode. Um, and and the, the literature that we see from this same period in time, from the first century, you know, this is realistic, not just realistic, but it's real. This happened. No, no other type of literature contains stories like this unless, unless they're real. This is the way it works. So that's the first point to note. But Mark has a larger purpose for dropping this true story in here, and that is the theme of, of healing, and in particular, uh, the theme of spiritual eyesight and spiritual healing. So first of all, we need to note something about, about spiritual blindness, several things. Um, you may remember from, from the message I preached previously that Jesus was complaining about the Pharisees. He's saying, you know, these Pharisees, their teaching, their doctrine, their, their, their approach to life is hypocritical, and it's like leaven. It's, it's like sin that works its way through. It is sin that works its way through all of life, and you don't even realize it's there, but it's corrupting everything. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, look, you're thick-headed too. You're not getting it. So the Pharisees don't get it. The disciples don't get it. The point is, nobody gets it. And we don't like hearing this because we like to think, <laughs> we like to think we're, we're the people to see. Or, or, you know, as, as we would sometimes say, you know, the whole world's crazy except for you and me. And sometimes I wonder about you. We like to think of ourselves as the only one who's sane in a crazy world, the only one who sees clearly. But what the Bible says unequivocally to us all is that we are all blind, spiritually blind. And we know this to be true, even though we don't like to admit it. We know this to be true. Think about it. 
if you look back on yourself, imagine your, yourself 10 years ago, as you look back on that, or 20 years ago. You know, what did you believe, what did you think you knew back then that you really didn't have a clue about? You know, and you've grown since then, and you've had your eyes open to some realities, and you look back and, and you kind of shake your head in pity on your former self. Well, here's the thing. If you live another 10 or 20 years, you're going to be looking back on yourself today and saying, what a fool I was. So, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to clue you into the fact you are a fool, and so am I. We're, if you don't recognize it clearly right now, you will someday. So you might as well just, just get a grip and, and recognize you are a fool. You're blind. You need help. And, and we don't like this picture of ourselves. We like to think that we can figure it out on our own. We don't need, well, we might need a little bit of help. You know, Jesus, if you'll just come in for an assist once in a while and help me, otherwise I've got it. But the Bible's real clear about the fact that we don't just need an assist from Jesus. We are in trouble. We are spiritually blind. We, we, we don't see clearly anything. And we need him. We desperately need him. Um, and in particular, you know, the theme here is spiritual sight. And, and that means discerning who Jesus is and, and how this whole thing works um, with, with being in a relationship with him. We like to think that, you know, if, if we do our part, if we read the Bible enough, if we go to church, um, we're, we're going to be able to, we've kind of got this guaranteed path to, to being able to see clearly. And that's actually not how it works. Short of a miracle from God, we will not see. Now, th this is radically different than, than the way the other religions go about it. The other religions basically say, you know, you, you sign up, you, you start attending our meetings, sign your name on the line, um, take these studies, join the community, and you're one of us, and, and you're going to get it. You're going to see clearly the way things are. And, and Christianity, a lot of people think Christianity is the same way, you know. Um, join the church, get baptized, put your name on the rolls, study your Sabbath school lesson, and, uh, and you're going you're gonna to have your eyesight open, you're going to be able to see clearly. But actually, that's not the case. Um, all those things are important, but they are not enough. Without a miracle of grace, you will not see who Jesus is. Because Jesus is not like other teachers. He's not just um, a teacher who has come to point us the way to God. He, he, has, he has come with, with a stumbling block kind of message that says, you're a sinner, lost forever, um, and without me, you can do nothing. And we look at that and we say, ah, Jesus, I'm not sure you're quite right about that. I, I'm actually quite capable of a lot. Um, Jesus says, no, what you need is a savior, utterly and completely, and I'm here, I'm that guy. Um, we want a teacher. We want somebody who's going to show us the way. But Jesus does so much more than that. He says, you can't find the way, even if I point it out to you, you're blind. I am here to save you. And the only way you're going to see that and to see who I am is if I heal you. That's Christianity. So how do we get healed? Several things that, that emerge from this story. And one is the fact that, that it's a process. Do you notice in this story that um, Jesus takes him by the hand and leads him, leads him out into a remote place where they can have time together? It's a process. Not only does Jesus do this, leads him out, but then the healing is this two-stage thing. Uh, it's not enough to be touched by Jesus once. You have to be touched again. And I think the point Mark is making here, that God is making to us, is that just because you've had an experience with Jesus, just because you have been converted, doesn't mean that your conversion's done. Doesn't mean it's finished. Doesn't mean that you see clearly. Um, we all have a different experience of coming to Christ, and we're at different stages along the way. Um, some of us have had the experience more like Paul the Apostle. You know, bright light flash from heaven knocks him from his horse. He's like, wow, I, I, I see. Except, except, did he see? In that moment, he was blinded. Three days later, he saw when somebody came to pray with him. But it was pretty, pretty uh, amazing, you know, life-shattering uh, moment that, that he has with Christ. But here, we're, we're talking about Peter. And, and we're going to get to more about Peter the next sermon. Because I'm going to continue this with, with Peter answering the question, who do you say that I am? 
Peter finally gets it. He, he finally acknowledges, you are the Christ. You, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. Peter gets it. But you know what? As you read through the story of Peter, you know, in one moment he's a fool, the next moment he's got great faith, and then he's back to being a fool, and then he's denying Jesus. And we, we see a man a lot like us. We, we desire, we, we, we fake ourselves into thinking, if you can have just one grand moment of conversion, that, that you know, Jesus is going to open your eyes and everything's clear from, from that point on. It's not the way it works. You may be in a place right now where you've had an experience with Christ. He's touched you once, but you're still looking out and, and you're, seeing, you're seeing better than you used to, but, but people look like trees walking around. And, and hopefully you recognize that, but maybe you don't. Here's the thing. If Jesus has done a work in your life, but, but you're struggling, you're feeling stuck, you're like, I'm not growing, take heart. Because what it means is that you have recognized enough. He, he, he's, he's touched you the first time. And because of that, you recognize that, that you're not seeing clearly. If he hadn't touched you at all, you, you, you might not even be aware of your need. But he's touched you once, and now you're seeing. And you're looking out and you're seeing people like trees, and you say, Jesus, I need more. And this brings us to the second point. So it's a process. It's an ongoing process. The second point is you need to interact with Jesus. I love this question that Jesus asks. Uh, what do you see? What do you see? Jesus is asking you and me that question. What do you see? Tell him what you see. Tell him, as I look out at the world, here's what I see. Here's what I see. I, I see people like trees walking. And let him then heal you. Let him point out to you how your vision is blurred. Let him touch you a second time. But unless you engage in that process, unless you let him take you by the hand and lead you out to a quiet place where the two of you can be together, it's not going to happen. You've got to interact with Jesus. And of course that happens through prayer and through Bible study. But it's prayer and Bible study are not guarantees. I mean, they're not just things you check off a list and you say, yeah, prayer, Bible study, got it, now I'm going to be healed. No, you've got to come to Jesus. Those are just avenues through which you can connect with him. But connect with Jesus, talk to him, hear him ask the question, what do you see? Third point here. So we're talking about um, process, we're talking about interacting with Jesus. Third, we're talking about community. Did you notice how this story starts, verse 22? Some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. You need community. You need a community of people around you who are going to beg Jesus on your behalf. Um, if you're by yourself, if you're all alone, and you don't have people around you who can bring you to Jesus, chances are you're not going to see. It, it just doesn't work that way. In order to see Jesus clearly, you need to be in a community of people who can bring you to him. And that's a church. That's a family of faith. You need to be connecting regularly with other people who are, who are seeking healing for themselves and seeking healing for you, who are praying for you, who are encouraging you. I am so encouraged and have been. I've been talking about this uh, for the last several weeks. Um, we have an awesome group of youth at our church, and, and some, of the, some of the young men in our church have a, have a Bible study. And during these times of COVID, um, it's hard to get together in person. Hey, even when it's not COVID, it's hard to get together in person. These guys get together virtually. You know, they, they've got a call where they connect with each other on a regular basis each week. And they, they study the Bible together and they talk about real life stuff and they pray for each other. And that is awesome because, you know what, they are having their spiritual eyesight restored and opened. They, they are being healed in the process and I see them growing as a result. It's happening for them. It doesn't mean it's they're perfect and they've got it all figured out. Quite the contrary. They're in the midst of the messy growth, growth process that all of us are in. But they're making progress. They're coming to Jesus. They're bringing each other to Jesus. If you don't have that in your life, you need that. That can happen in your home, you know, if you're married. If, if you're married to a Christian spouse, that is, God has given you a gift right there. Somebody who you can, that's a prayer partner. That's somebody who can be taking you to Jesus for healing. Um, but maybe you don't have that. Or even if you do, you need a larger community than that. You need to be reaching out. Reach out to other people in your church family or in your family and, and connect with them and ask them to be your prayer support, to, to talk with them about Jesus. Let them bring you to Jesus. 
And finally, this last point about how it happens. You know, it's a process. You got to interact with Jesus. It happens in community. And finally, it is, <laughs> it is, it is what, you, what you will see. What you will see when you see. And that is you will see Jesus. I mean, that, that's the ultimate... Uh, the, the vision of Jesus is everything. Because it's in seeing Jesus that we are healed further. It's, it's in seeing Jesus that we know that we are being healed. And, and let, let me try to unpack that a little bit. We actually find a hint of it right here. Right, right here in the story. You know, a couple of times, and in fact, it's all through the Gospels. Jesus heals somebody and he says, oh yeah, don't go back into town. Don't tell anybody about this. Keep it hush-hush. And of course, people, uh, people aren't very good at keeping it hush-hush. They often go and blab everywhere. You know, wow, I just got healed. It's this guy, Jesus. But why was Jesus doing that? Why, why was he telling people to, to keep it under wraps? It, it's not that he wanted to be all secretive. It, it's not that he didn't want people testifying. But he knew. He knew where his story was headed. He knew that there were enemies who were out to get him. And, and the more that word spread of what he was doing, the faster he was going to end up on a cross. And it wasn't his time yet. He needed to prolong his ministry a little bit longer. And so he says, hold on, don't tell anybody about this. And when the time was right and he entered Jerusalem, everybody's shouting Hosanna, everybody's shouting his name. Um, the Pharisees were saying, tell everybody to be quiet. And he said, hey, even the rocks would cry out if they were quiet. So there, it wasn't that Jesus didn't want praise. It, he, no, there was a time and a place where, okay. But that was, that was the week right before the cross. That was days before the cross. And he knew the more attention that, that was turned upon him, the closer was his death. But in spite of the fact that every bit of attention brought him closer to his death, Jesus still healed. He cared for people in spite of the cost to himself. And that's what I want you to see. It's in seeing that that you are healed. It's in seeing that that you know you're being healed. It's in, in seeing the, the incredible grace of God poured out for you on the cross that you and I have our eyes opened. When you recognize that, that it cost something, for Jesus in order to heal you. When you recognize that in order for you to have light and sight, he had to be plunged into darkness. On the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Literally, the sun refused to shine. Darkness covered the face of the earth. And, and Jesus felt himself cut off from the presence of his father. The light in which he walked his entire life with clear vision, that light was snatched away from him and he plunged into darkness. Why? Why would he do that? In order to give you sight, in order to give me sight. When we see that, when we see what Jesus has done, that he is a complete savior, that we are utterly helpless, that we need him, and in our moment of greatest need, he did everything, laying down his own life for us. When we see that, we are healed. Let Jesus heal you. Let Jesus heal you of your blindness. Recognize your need. Come to him. Spend time with him. Get in community with others. And look, look at the cross where Jesus gave everything for you and me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your healing power. Help us. We need another touch from you. We need an ongoing touch from you. Thank you. Amen. And now, saints of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.